Welcome to the 31st Annual Brock Gap Heritage Day. I'm pleased to introduce today Joe T. May, although I know he doesn't need much of an introduction in this crowd, because he is a graduate of Broadway High School and uh, Virginia Tech, and he's also a, been a or he is a professional engineer. In 1997, he founded EIT LLC. He currently holds 28 patents. Is that the current number? Yep. Okay, and it usually changes every year. <laughs> With his latest involving latest patent involving helicopter instrumentation. He served 20 years as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates, where he chaired the Science and Technology Committee and the House Transportation Committee. Joe's an avid history buff, especially uh, concerning World War II. In 2009, he became interested in knowing more about the World War II soldiers from our area, from Rockingham County, who were killed in action. Uh, and then in collaboration with the sisters, they've researched and written World War II stories of various soldiers whose heroic sacrifices are now recorded and memorialized in the Plains District Memorial Museum. So let's, let's uh, welcome Joe for the Heritage Day. Thank you. And, and thank you, Pat, and good to see everybody here today. I, got, I put this together kind of late last night, so bear with me if there are more than a few rough spots, but we'll make it one way or the other. Well, first of all, yes, I am familiar with this room. The last time I was here, they handed me a diploma right over there, <laughs> and that was June 6, 1955. So, um, a lot has happened since then. Well, first of all, um, we've done, with some help from various people who are here in the audience or otherwise, a raid. Um, we've done the story of 21 different people from Rockingham County who went off to World War II and didn't return alive. Uh, today is a happy difference from that trend or tradition. And in this case, the Will brothers, Warren and Stanley, came home and did survive the war, although they didn't go totally untouched by the war. Um, anybody here know the Will family? Uh, okay, good. How many people knew Warren and Stanley personally? Okay, good. I, Trying to get a little closer okay. to you. Sorry. Um, I, I usually don't get criticized for talking too little. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the Warren and Stanley lived right up the road from us, is the way we always described it, along North Mountain Road. And in fact, we used to go to their house a lot uh, to fill up our water tank. They had water that came out of a spring went into a, a, a watering trough, and we would come there and load our 110 gallon water tank that we used to water the turkeys out of their uh, faucet, the spigot that ran all the time. And it was always a, a pretty big deal because we would go once or twice a week to get a load of water from the wills. Anyway, um, Warren and Stanley Will lived on North Mountain Road very near us. And in fact, if we see if this goes. Well, okay. This is Warren and Stanley. That's Warren Lomax Will on the left, and that's Stanley Eugene Will on the right. Your right. And this is the Will home um, that looks like a current. Those look like current pictures, not back in the 19, early 1940s when we used to go there. The, uh, by the way, the, trying to find the, there we go, good. Water, water trough was right in there, we park and fill up the water tank. I, we, I have pictures of the water tank and I was tempted to include it in, 
not that it's historically significant, but it was certainly significant for us because our turkeys would have really suffered if we didn't have the water for them. Um, nice barn. Um, I, I remember it was big and white and imposing, and actually um, Stanley's life ended there. So let's move along. So in 1940, excuse me, 41, 42, uh, both Warren and Stanley registered for the draft because uh, Selected Service was just starting then and they, and they knew the war was coming. So they wanted to get everybody lined up well ahead of time. So uh, it's sort of interesting. Oh, excuse me. Here, here's a uh, little map to the, the the black areas here that you see are people that we wrote about previously who went off to World War II and, and didn't survive it. But if you look closely, you'll see the Will brothers are on there, and they did. And I'm happy to add them to the to the map. But if you want some idea of how heavily Rockingham County contributed to the war effort, there's a small indication of what they did contribute. Um, <clears throat> so in 1942, uh, Warren went off to Camp Sampson, New York, to take basic training. And he volunteered, and the way I know he volunteered is when I look at his serial number, it started with a one. And if he was volunteered, you had a one in front of it, and if you were drafted, you had a three in front of it. And we'll look at Stanley and Warren's dog tags in a couple of minutes, and you'll see how I knew whether, which way they went. Warren, Warren volunteered, and apparently had a, a deal with the Army that he would obtain rank a little more quickly, and he would have his choice of some duty assignments. Well, Warren apparently volunteered for the Army Air Force, and he took audition, he auditioned uh, when he first went in to see whether or not he would be able to fly. And um, if you look at this flight record here, you'll see that he would, would have the opportunity to fly a T-6 Texan, which was an advanced uh, trainer that was a preliminary to flying fighters, and he also flew a, um, a T-18, which was a uh, eight-passenger, nine-passenger airplane that they used for other things like, uh, well, carrying small bombs, having a gun platform behind him. So he, he put in about eight hours or so, but a, this was in Fort Myers, Florida, and um, he apparently wasn't chosen for that, but they did chose, choose him for air crew, and he turned out to be a waste gunner on a B-24 bomber. So he, he left New York, went to Fort Myers, and then they sent him to Colorado to Camp Lowry, which was for Air Force basic training. And there he learned to become a crewman for the B-24. B-24 is a heavy bomber and it has the distinctive dual rudders on the back. If you ever see them, you, you'll recognize them immediately because they're one of the few aircraft that had that. Boy, they have a lot of them. So, um, oh good. Um, this is just uh, actually um, the um, Warren, let's see. Warren's niece uh, was very good about turning up some of these documents. And, uh, let's see, do we have the niece in the audience? Okay, I guess we don't. In any event, uh, I owe her some thanks because she was able to turn up quite a few of Warren's records. Well, um, <laughs> this is the uh, training that. Uh, Warren took in as a basic training uh, routine. Notice he's firing several weapons, including the 45 and the carbine 
in the Soviet Union. <laughs> it's just like uh, old times, except that this is the end of the war. They were warned to come home from Europe. They sent him to basic training, even though he's got three years of combat time uh, in the Air Force. Uh, it, to me, it sort of struck me as ironic that he had to go through that mess because it's not much fun. Uh, they were anticipating having to invade Japan. They wanted to make sure that the guys were ready for it. And of course, there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of fun in that. So anyway, Warren goes to Colorado, takes training. Um, they fly around through the West. Uh, one of the places he was uh, located for a while for training was Blythe, California. And you say, where the heck is Blythe, California? Well, it's right between the border between California and Nevada. And a couple years ago, I was <laughs> flying a helicopter from California back to here, and we had an oil leak in the helicopter, so we had to land. And where we landed was in Blythe, California. And lo and behold, the place where we landed was right in front of the hangar that Warren flew out of when he was there, what, you know, 60 years prior to that. It sort of struck me as ironic. And boy, I can see why they put him down there, because if anything happened, they weren't going to hurt anybody, because there wasn't anything there to hurt. And they flew, uh, in fact, in one of Warren's letters home, he writes, um, well, I've got to go fly at 9 o'clock till 2 a.m., and this is night flying at low level over the desert. And frankly, given the opportunity, I would have passed. But Warren didn't have that choice. So in uh, January 1943, Warren's outfit the 566 bomb squadron with B-24s left for England. They, they flew the northern route, which takes them up over Newfoundland and up that way. I prospected flying, doing that much flying in a uh, pretty ordinary bomber at 180 miles an hour leaves me pretty cold. I'm sure it left him cold because uh, they had to wear flight suits. They didn't have heaters or pressurized cockpits. So they flew to England to a place called Heffel Royal Air Force Base, which is just east of London and down on the coast. And the reason they put them there was that they were going to fly missions against Europe. And at the narrowest point, England is only 20 miles from France or from Germany. So uh, they were putting them close to the job, so to speak. So. Warren was on this, this is just the, the runways here, and these are the actual runways. If you look closely, in fact, here's the bomb dome. Uh, there's a gasoline storage area. They lived in, in barracks pretty much along the sides of the air base. And he was, Warren was there from January 43, excuse me, uh, yeah. January 43 to July of 44. So this is Hebel Air Base and they would, typically they flew at day rather than at night in England and which meant they got shot up a lot more unhappily. So he's here and out of here he flies 32 <coughs> combat missions, which in those days, they would let you go home, typically, after you've done 30. And these, these weren't simple missions. They, they went from to six to eight hours, and this is six to eight hours in which most of the time you're in fear of your life. And Warren was a waste gunner and assistant radio operator. This is a waste gunner right here. And I want you to look closely at this, because this could very well, it, it isn't Warren, but very well could have been. See all the empty 50 caliber casings here on the floor. I want you to look at what he's wearing, however. See the, he's got the fleece lined boots, fleece lined coat, 
three slant gloves. This is oxygen, and he has to be on oxygen all the time because if he loses that oxygen mass, um, he's not going to survive because there's not enough oxygen to support him. So imagine yourself in this situation for six or eight hours, and the temperature, by the way, can be as low as minus 50. The suit that he's got on is electrically heated, so if you lose power, that's not good for you because you're not going to be very comfortable. In fact, uncomfortable would be more like it. See the little seat he's got here? He could, if they weren't actively engaged, he could sit down in the little seat and it went a little faster, but it's, it's well, you can tell that people, the Germans had been called up. Let's take a look at the, all the empty casings here. So he's banging the way out the window. That's a 50 caliber machine gun. And that was his job. And he did that at least 32 times. So um, he, he received an award. And, and I, I find this sort of amusing. He called him a lucky bastard um, bomb mission list and they called him lucky bastard because he was lucky to have survived and, and no ifs, buts, and ands about it. These are um, the missions that he flew um, that qualified him for the quote lucky bastard club and this by the way is still a club and, and if you look it up on the internet you'll see some of the people who are still members of it. Um, a couple of things that struck me of interest. Uh, I've been to at least three of the cities that they were bombing. Let's see. Uh, oh. Uh, Brunswick. Um, <laughs> interesting enough, our company does business with a company there in Brunswick and they've got a nice new train station and the reason they got such a nice new train station is that the U.S. bombed it flat in World War II and they rebuilt it because uh, I asked them about how they came to it. Um, I guess the other place that struck me interesting that Warren flew to in, in a bombing mission was in D-Day support and they were bombing the beaches at Normandy and Bill Crowder, excuse me, not Bill Crowder, uh, Orville Neff, who lived literally right up the road from Warren Will. Warren was dropping bombs uh, on the beach as Orville Neff was coming ashore at Normandy. And I just found that, I, I'm sure he didn't know that, but I just find that tremendously ironic that you got one guy dropping bombs while the other guy is trying to get away from them. So, Anyway, um, Warren flies 32 missions, and they actually gave him an eight-day furlough in the middle of that, and I, and I found the letter that he had written to his parents, and he was talking about what a nice place it was and how pretty it was and how quiet it was, but compared to flying in the back of the B-24, I'm sure it looked great if there was anything that wasn't shooting at him. So, in Ju the last flight that Warren flew uh, was 11 June 1944, and it, he came down with, I guess, what they used to call combat fatigue, and they uh, decided he had 32 missions in at that point, so he was um, eligible to go off the job and bring somebody else in. So they put him on a hospital ship and to bring him back to the U.S. And it goes to show that they built him pretty tough on North Mountain Road because uh, here's Warren going home because of combat fatigue and the commander of the ship uh, wrote him a letter of commendation because he said, 
he, he pointed out that Warren was there because he needed the rest and recuperation, and he went on board a week early and conducted himself in such a way that he felt it was appropriate to commend him for his performance. And um, I, somehow or another, that, that just sits right with me. And I will say that almost all the guys that I've written about, we've written about from here in Rockingham County had the same sort of gung-ho attitude. And you can't help but admire that. I, I can't help but admire it. So anyway, um, by the way, this people along the bottom here are, I find out that, uh, there we go. Uh, Warren should be, does anybody see where Warren is? Anyway, he, he's listed, uh, th these are the various crewmen right here on, on his aircraft. And Warren was listed as the, as the waste gunner. Um, so in July, they put him on a ship, sent him back to the US. They were gonna use him for recruiting, but I think the, frankly, the wear and tear had been too much on him. So they sent him to do training at Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, Colorado for a while. And then sort of drifted from place to place and in October 1945, the war was over, and they sent Warren home. So here it is, 1945. He's done. There's a letter of commendation, by the way, from the commander of the, the hospital ship, the Aquitania. It's worth, worth reading it because actually the guy didn't have to write the letter, and it was obviously believe what he was saying. Here are some of the medals that Warren received. Uh, this is a distinguished flying cross here, and that's a that's a fairly major award. Um, I, I think this is um, a distinguished flying cross. I, I've forgotten the the proper name for this, but I noticed that it has oak leaf clusters, which means that he received it numerous times, several times. And um, <laughs> one on the left here is a good conduct medal, but if they didn't throw you in jail, and you didn't have a communicable disease, you probably got it. M most of us here who were in the service probably ended up with the same walker. Uh, <coughs> you don't have to contest anything you don't want to. Um, but uh, n not a bad group of awards. Um, I find this sort of interesting. This is volunteer. Um, he had a tetanus shot in 1943. Um, he had blood type B, if I understand correctly. And down here, uh, my, there we go. He was a Protestant. He's from Broadway, Virginia, and proud of it. So, anyway, I, I found that sort of interesting. And there, if you look closely, it looks like his thumbprint on it there, but I don't know in what. And so, <clears throat> Warren went home, and he lived at, at home for the rest of his life. He lived till 1997. And this is his gravestone at uh, St. Luke's Church at what I always called County Line Church in Shenandoah County. Didn't know, it, didn't know it was buried there until we started looking at this. And we, my brothers and sisters and I went to Warbaugh Grade School, which is only a mile or two up the road from the cemetery. And again, I didn't know that Warren was buried there. In fact, apparently it's a family plot. So, um, Warren lived from 1924 to 1997, uh, lived at home, never married, uh, was a responsible member of the community, 
but died fairly early at age 72, 73. And I always wondered if that in the wear and tear that he received in the European campaign had something to do with that. Um, so, um, Now, when Warren was leaving in 1942, a year later, his brother Stanley uh, was drafted. He actually, I think, volunteered for the draft. They sent him to New York to, to Camp Sampson, the same place that Warren had gone just a year later. And they drafted him from a holding group there at Sampson. And in uh, July of 1943, um, they take Stanley into the Navy for a modest amount of basic training and then send him to Norfolk. And, um, Stanley, we, we honestly don't know much about Stanley's career because he went to Fort Story, Virginia, and later to Deep Creek uh, in the Norfolk area. And he was apparently involved in a super secret um, operation that involved very advanced electronics. He was a communications man, but I literally am able to find just about nothing, except I found the names of some of the ships that it was on. And I've, I've got a picture of the ship, and you look at the ships, and they were bristling with electronics in, in a period in which electronics wasn't used very much or was pretty uncommon. So I, what I do know is that uh, uh, what I do know is that he served uh, in the Pacific somewhere. And uh, this, by the way, is is Stanley's registration for the draft. And uh, that's the front and the back. You notice know, he's five uh, ten, or excuse me, five eight, weight one forty five. But he was plenty muscular. In fact, he suffered a skull fracture playing soccer while he was at Fort Store. I did find that out. So th this, is, by the way, you may know his uh, the person who is the. Uh, Registrar for the draft. I, I can't read it from here, but she was the person who, up at Coots's, registered people for the draft. And um, Stanley certainly qualified. I can't read it here either. But, but if you, I'll have printed copies of this eventually. You might take a look at it and see if you knew the people who, who did it did the registration. By the way, I noticed Stanley was unemployed, and I thought, gee, I wonder why he's unemployed. Well, he's 18 and he just got out of high school, and this was uh, at the end of the Great Depression. So, not remarkable that both Stanley and Warren might be unemployed at that period in their life, because there wasn't much going on those days. It's a picture of Stanley down at Fort Story, and apparently this was a a wedding ceremony. And see, this is Stanley. Should be him right here. Uh, but some, a couple of things are sort of unusual. I see a Marine uh, uniform. I see Army uniforms. I see Navy uniforms. Uh, and I see hardwood inlaid floor, which tells me that it's probably an officer's club uh, at Fort Story. But other than that, I don't know whose wedding it was. But unusual for a, a very junior enlisted man to be invited to a, a social event like that. <laughs> this was the ship that Stanley was on, the USS. McKinley, and oops, 
if you look, see all those antennas? Those aren't there just to dry the wash on. Uh, there's uh, a couple of radars here. There's some long distance communication and they had a couple of admirals and a couple of generals on board at one time or another and they were conducting operations in the, uh, well, the invasion of both Leyte Gulf and, which by the way is where Paul Andes died, was at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So Stanley was there, but he, I'm certain he didn't know Paul was, Paul was on a troop ship and this was a command ship that stood offshore a bit. They were also uh, part of coordinating the invasion of the Iwo Jima. So I, I was able to find a few things out, but this was the primary ship that Stanley was on, and this is what the ship looked like about that time. And uh, <laughs> this, um, in October of 1945, they decided that they would bring Stanley back to the U.S. And this happens to be the transfer from the Mount McKinley to the Cavallero, which is another ship that was headed to the West Coast, and that's how Stanley got back to the U.S. They kept him uh, for now let's see, till May of 1946, I believe, and uh, when they discharged him, Stanley came home in May of 1946. He also stayed at home, and uh, he went to work almost immediately for VDOT as a bookkeeper, and that was what he apparently had some training in in the Navy, but it, that was never revealed in anything I found. So, Stanley lives at home, as does Warren, until um, December 30th, 1968, at, at which time he passed away. So, uh, he was 44 at the time, and you can conjecture that service life uh, was pretty hard on him, uh, and uh, actually, this is separation documents for Stanley. And if you look closely up here, this is the only real record that I could find of where he had been over the three years, almost three full years that he was gone, and. Uh, that reads a little bit like gibberish. I didn't mean it much to me. I found a few things that I recognized. So, the Will Boys went to war. And, and they, nobody could say they didn't give a bullet, because they did. And they both died a bit young. And I, I, again, you can, I used to see them after they were out, and we would come to fill up with the turkey water tank. <laughs> and they never had all that much to say. I, I think they sort of subdued them for the rest of their lives. So that was the Will Boys. Um, nobody could say that they didn't give their all. They well, who they did. And for which, me for one, and I would say you could well afford to be grateful for it. So that was the Will Boys. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, I, I'm just amazed at how much stuff you find out about what people did that you had no idea they did it or they had that sort of stuff in them. Um, I, well, th these are just excellent examples of that. So, already, any any questions or anybody would like to comment regarding it? Okay. I, I, I will have this cleaned up and uh, with much more supporting detail. And this is about all I can remember. I, I didn't finish until kind of late last night. So, um, 
Good. Thank you. Thank you for being a good audience. They say, uh, be brief, or be, be to the point, be brief, be seated. I'm about to be seated. <laughs>